Good morning, Glory. Good to see you, all you beautiful people. Now, I always think I should say this to you. You're beautiful regardless of the fact that the lights are dim. Okay? Um, actually, I guess now that you mention it, or now that I mention it, it's a little embarrassing that the lights shine on me. But uh, anyway, may the light shine on Jesus. It is good to, to share with you. Um, some of us had a rough night last night. Uh, rooting for football games. Um, I was a little disappointed. I know some of you are happy because things turned out pretty well, but some of us are disappointed. But I have to say that, um, you know, I was in the restaurant and I was thinking, you know what, my alma mater, the College of Worcester, won. Yeah, everybody's like, well, okay. So. <laughs> but then I thought they'd be Allegheny, and that's where Haley Beaver goes. So that's, or, I mean, I guess, you know, I know. Oh my gosh. I was all happy in the Nets temper, but uh, I'm glad that uh, our joy for a living is not dependent on if the Browns win the day, right, <laughs> or if the Steelers win today, right, <laughs> or if the Buckeyes are Actually, I think it leads to an important question that the scripture leads us to today. And that is to ask and to consider, uh, who do you love? Who do you love? And let your mind go to the things, to the people that you love. Who do you love? Who comes to mind? It's a spouse, perhaps, a child. Could be a best friend. Uh, it could be a lot of people. Actually, it could be no people. It could be things, right? Like... I gotta say, I see Denise caught my eye. I was bragging on your cookies yesterday to our boys. I mean, I love Denise Hayden's cookies. Okay? They're really good. But, um, but what is your first love? That's a crucial question to answer and to ponder. And I believe Jesus and Peter's interaction on the beach instructs us, it's instructive for us into how to know what our first love is to be. <coughs> Who do you love? What is your first love? And not only that, what is your deepest love in life? We're going to be journeying together these next four Sundays talking about how do we respond to Jesus. I mean, we've heard about Jesus in the Psalms. We've been talking about Jesus. And I've got to tell you something. The day we quit talking about Jesus in here, you ought to leave. In fact, you'd be better off if you might. The day that we quit talking about Jesus in here. Okay? Just tell him, give him your permission. But how do we respond to Jesus? Peter was invited to go beyond lip service, go beyond the surfacing kind of things, go beyond the quick knee jerk reaction. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. To answer the question, Really, Peter, what is your first love? What is your deepest love in life? Let's think about this for a little bit together because I think it's important for us. Again, I believe it's instructive, but I think that we have to go back to those, those hours before Jesus gave his life on the cross, an act of love. So if you have a Bible with you and you turn it, flip it, I invite you to do it to chapter 22 in Luke's Gospel account. Yes, Phil read from John, but we're going to touch a little bit on Luke because something here is very important. It's the hours before Jesus' crucifixion. They're at the Last Supper and Jesus is there with his disciples. They've got the meal and then the bread and the cup. They're celebrating the Passover. Jesus is redefining this for them, for us. And then, as Luke's account has it, a dispute breaks out. Now, I got to tell you, if anybody ever suggests to you that the Bible is about anything but real life, I got an example for you. And it's this week. <coughs> a dispute breaks out about who's the greatest. Who's the greatest amongst those who were in that upper room? Now, think about that. Jesus has basically said, I'm going to die. I'm going to die on the cross. It's coming soon. And they start talking about who's the greatest. Really? Seriously? 
And then, Jesus says something that I think is very important for us to hear, for what we're hearing and talking about today. He says this, after they get over and Jesus talks about what it means to love and what it means to be a leader, and basically reminding them that being a leader means being a servant of people. Then Jesus says this, Simon, Simon, now that's, he's referring to Peter, Simon Peter, same dude, Phil read about a little bit ago. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I pray for you, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, when you read that, you know how it is in English language, I can say you and mean you, and I can say you and I can mean you. Well, this first you here is referring to everybody that's in that room. What Jesus is saying is that the devil wants to shake you up. He wants to mess you up. He wants to mess up what God intends to do through my crucifixion and my resurrection and in the world to reconcile the cosmos to God. He wants to mess with you, all of you. And he's particularly saying to Peter, now listen, you're going to be shaking, rattling, and roll, bro. But you hang with me and be there for your brothers once you come back to me. Now I imagine they're sitting there and they're like, wow, what just hit me? What's going to happen? <coughs> and then soon enough, when Jesus was in the garden, when they come to arrest him, there's Peter. He's got the sword. He cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. He's ready to fight. But what Jesus had told him and was going to tell him is that, Peter, I know you say you're all in with me. I know you say you're going to go with me to wherever, even to death. But I'm telling you that before that cock crows, you're going to deny you know me three times. Sure enough, don't you know? That's what happened. If you're reading your Bible, you see the story, and you hear that Peter said, I don't know, I don't know the guy. And he wept bitterly when he realized that, in fact, he had betrayed him. He had not fessed up to being a follower of Jesus. Now imagine living with that burden on your heart and in your mind. Day after day, since that time. You saw him up on a cross, suffering and believing in him. You went to a tomb to find him, and there he was not there. It was empty. Imagine what this man was living with, day in and day out. The weight upon him. Because in fact, he did love Jesus. He'd loved him all along. But he was a human being. He was weak. And what he so desperately needed was to be, if you will, rehabilitated, made right with God again through Jesus. He needed to be forgiven. Now, I can't speak for you. But then again, I can. Oh, I may not know the details. But I know you need to be forgiven, as do I. There's not a single human being on planet Earth that doesn't need to be forgiven. And so go with your mind to the beach, which is an awesome place to go. I love the story because they're on the beach, they have breakfast. <coughs> I've never had fish for breakfast. Have any of you ever had fish for breakfast? I was thinking about trying chicken. You know, going to Chick-fil-A someday, that would be a big deal for me. <laughs> so there they are walking on the beach. And Peter is walking with Jesus. And, and Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me more than these? I think Peter's upset. Now see, Peter's remembering what happened. And he knows that Jesus knows everything. He knows Jesus knows what's in his head and in his heart. And it's basically he's like, Jesus, why are you asking me this question? You know the answer. You know I love you. And Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Peter's like, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Three times he asks him. Remember back in the, before his crucifixion, he said three times that you're going to deny him. And now three times Peter is asked, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. 
And the love word there is not the romantic kind of love, you know, the big smoochy, smoochy kind, you know, that, 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 that's an awesome kind of love. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about that godly love, that divine love, that is deepest possible love, affectionate. It's given though it, it's not deserved. It's a love that extends and it, it, it combines two different kinds of love in the Greek word is meaning that it is a fondness and it's an affectionate love, but it's a deeper love. It's the kind of love that you can't deserve and you can't repay. The kind of love that God has for you and for me and every human being and it's right there and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? But you got to think about this with me. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, what's he talking about? He didn't just say, Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? I think this too is instructive for us because I think it challenges you and me in our thinking. <coughs> See, I love my wife. Love my best friend. Love my family. Love my kids. Love you. There's some other things I love. Denise Hagen's cookies. <laughs> For example. Peter could have been asked, uh, Peter, do you love me more than your uh, fishing business? It's kind of made a bit one there. They could have been asking that. Peter, do you love me more than your fishing business? This thing that you've built from the ground up that you take great pride in this business that has sustained you and others. Peter, do you love me more than these brothers and sisters who are here with you on the beach today? Peter, do you love me more than your wife? Peter was married. Now just think about that. What's your first love? What's your deepest love? I remember when Sandra and I were going to get married, and we did, as a matter of fact, three years ago. Uh, but before we got married, she was telling me about uh, her brother's wedding, which I did not attend because I didn't know her then. And uh, there was this song she was telling me that they sang at the wedding. I was highly offended by it. It was something like, um, if God is first in my life, then you'll be number two. I'm like, now wait a minute. What do you mean I'm going to be number two? It's that kind of question I think Jesus is asking Peter, and he's asking you, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your spouse? Do you love me more than your business? Do you love me more than your things? Do you love me more than the Buckeyes? Do you love me more than the Browns? Do you love me? And you can go on and on and on. Peter, do you love me more? Friends, what is your first love? What is your deepest love? I suggest to you that if you make Jesus your first love and your deepest love, then all of those other loves in your life are going to be put in the right perspective. You're going to love your spouse rightly. You're going to love your children rightly. You're going to love your friends rightly. You're going to love your Jesus rightly. You're going to love everything rightly because you have made the first thing the first thing. Do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. If, then, it's one of those things in life, I'm not sure the grammatical uh, terminology for it, frankly, uh, it just pops into my head. The if, then, but there's an if, then there, isn't there? If, then, if you love me more than these, then, and what does he say to Peter to do? If you love me more than these, then tend my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my lambs, take care of these things. I'm thinking about uh, what's going on with the hurricanes and the fires out west. Um, Sandra and I were in Naples this summer, so I've been keenly watching, wondering if the people home in the state and what's going to be with that. You know, people tell me stories. I, I went to buy some stuff at GNC yesterday, and a young man working there said, my, my aunt lives in Fort Myers, and she's an artist. They live right on the water, and she's had to leave a bunch of her art there. She doesn't know what's going to happen. I'm thinking, well, my son's an artist. 
How terrible, how awful. I mean, all of this. We're troubled. We wonder what's going on and what's happening. What is our first love? What is it that drives us? What is it that sustains us? There are a lot of people that are going to be doing a lot of good things because of these hurricanes and wildfires and everything else. There are going to be people that do good things, not because they believe in Jesus or follow Jesus, but just because they want to do good things. That's awesome. That's laudable. I am thankful for people like that who don't even know Jesus, maybe don't even believe in God, but want to do good things to help people. Lord, may their number increase that want to help people who are in need. I'm all for that. But here's the thing, friends. Here's how it gets different. You and I believe in Jesus, and because He is our first love, that's why we do what we do. That's what moves us. And i got to tell you, can't guarantee it, but i got to tell you, I believe that those who do what they do out of faith are the ones who are there when everybody else leaves. They are the ones. We are the ones. Not that we're better than anybody else. Don't hear me saying that. Don't walk away saying, no. uh, Tom was saying that you know, we're better than these other people who do good. I ain't saying that. What I am saying is there are times in life when because you love Jesus, and because he calls you to do something, that you're going to do it, even when you don't want to do it, even when you are sacrificing to do it, and even when you're scared to do it. But it is your faith that will sustain you. We do what we do because of faith. Peter, do you love me more than these? If you love me, then you will give, and you will sacrifice, and you will care for, and you will tend, and you will set free. As I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking, what are some of the things that others in the faith have said centuries ago? How they interpreted this passage that Phil read from John's Gospel. How do we understand what Peter was asked to do? If you love me more than these, then. What's the then? Here are some of the thens. Bind up the broken. The broken hearted. The broken minded. The broken body. Bind them up. Strengthen the weak, comfort the afflicted, challenge injustice, encourage the suffering and the faltering, bring in those who are far away and hold on in a loving way to those who are close. Bring home the wanderer, raise up leaders, guard the flock, instruct in the faith. These are just some of the things that are the answer to, if you love me, then. Now you might say, okay, Tom. Great. Really good. But he's talking to Peter. He's not talking to me. <laughs> May I suggest you in love that he's talking to me and he's talking to you. Because you see, the fact that you are a human being and you have other people in your life means you are an influencer. It means you're rubbing up against people in a godly good way. You're rubbing up against people's lives. And you have a stake in their life. And you have a, an ability to make a difference in their life. And so, yeah, he's talking to Peter. He's talking to me. And he's talking to you. He's talking to his church. This is how you live. If you love me. If you make me your number one love in life. If you love me deeply. Then this is how you will live. How do we love Jesus? So Jesus, earlier in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 10, um, tells a story. There's this guy that comes to him and he says, you know, Jesus, how do I get eternal life? You know, this Jesus is this great teacher. He's thinking he's got wisdom. This guy's on the right track. I want to pick his brain. I want to know how do I get eternal life? How can I live forever? How can I live in God's domain, God's kingdom? Jesus says, well, what do you think? He says, well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all, all your soul, with all your strength. So, he's saying, you be right with me, and then because you're right with me, because you love me, then you're going to go this way with me. You love me this way, and you'll go this way. And so he's like, 
I'll give an answer right now. Now why don't you go do that? Well, as the story goes, as you might remember, the, the man was like, well now, who's my neighbor? Now, Dr. Carl tells us, Carl, you said, that, fix me if I'm wrong, if I look in the mirror, everybody besides me that I see is my neighbor. Is that a fair interpretation? So in other words, you know, everybody's your neighbor other than you. Everybody. You may not even know ever me. There's people right now in the way of Irma, Harvey, the wildfires. They're, they're your neighbor. He says you love your neighbor like yourself. And then he tells a story that many of us know as the story of the Good Samaritan. You read that in Luke 10, and you're like, whoa, how about that? Here's a guy that everybody would have said, oh, man, he's like, you know, he's good for nothing. He's a Samaritan, and, well, you know, we don't think much of them, and their ethnic background is not good, and their religious practices are not good, and where they live is not good, and, well, let me tell you a story about a Samaritan I knew once, and they did this to me, and mm, that's not good, and here in the story, guess who gets it right? The Samaritan. Jesus tells stories like that to say, if I'm your first love, this is what it looks like. Now, I'm almost done, but I think this is really important. Oftentimes, and especially I will say in this beautiful fellowship of faith called Chardon Church, we have such an impulse to help people in need that sometimes we rush to help before we have prayed up to know what to do. And as I said earlier, you can do great things in the world and help people without God being in any part of it. But you know what? That's not who we are. We're the church. When we help people, we do it because of our faith. We do it because Jesus is our first love. But we've got to pay attention to that relationship. We are to love like Jesus, learn His ways, and lead by His example. That relationship is critical. You see, because what Peter experienced wasn't Jesus saying, Hey, Peter, I need you to go do this. He started with, Peter, do you love me? Peter, I am here forgiving you, brother. I am forgiving you of every weight, everything clinging to you. Do you love me? I am setting you free, Peter. Do you love me? And he's asking you the same question. He's telling you that I'm setting you free. I'm forgiving you from everything that's hanging on to you and holding on to you. You just got to let it go. You are forgiven. I am forgiving you. God says that through Jesus to you, to us. You are forgiven. Now will you. Ten. Will you feed the vulnerable, the struggling, in whatever way that looks like. Now, Two more things. Part of what Phil did not read, because I didn't ask him about this, is um, what happens in this same chapter toward the end. So Peter and Jesus walking along the beach, having this conversation. It's kind of like John, the beloved apostle, the one who wrote the gospel here, uh, is kind of tagging along. It's almost like he's eavesdropping on the conversation. I don't know, but anyway, he's walking along behind. And Jesus tells Peter some pretty heavy stuff. You know, this is what your future is going to look like. And Peter, for like three decades, lived with the weight of knowing that he was probably going to die in martyrs. <coughs> Think about that. Think about having that over your head. <coughs> I mean, we know we're going to die, but he's like, Peter, you're going to die. It, it was not a good way that Peter died, by the way. He was crucified. Legend has it upside down, though that has not been confirmed. But he died and he was crucified. He lived for 30 years. He preached powerfully. He helped heal people by the Spirit's power. He did amazing things for three decades before he was crucified, knowing that this was coming. And what does Jesus say to him? Well, Peter's like, well, what about this guy? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus is like, Peter, don't be, don't be messing. Don't be worried about that. Love him. But don't compare yourself to him. I got a plan for him. I got to wait for him. You live your life 
and let John live his life. And I want to say to you, you live your life. Don't try to live somebody else's life. Don't say, um, well, I see them serving in that way, so I ought to be serving in that way. Or they're doing this, so I ought to be doing that. No, you have a relationship with Jesus. You listen to him through your church. You listen to him through the body of believers. And he will help you to discover what your life path is going to look like. How you are intended to love him. There's a woman who I don't know, named Barbara Isaacs. She was trying to get her mind around this idea of how do I love Jesus? What does loving Jesus look like? And here's what she wrote. My first answer was Mother Teresa, which is probably how I would think that. She's the picture of a selfless woman who simply gave herself to the unwanted people and forgotten places in the name of Jesus. What more is there really? But then Barbara continues. But then my mind flooded with a thousand different pictures right here at home. My friends bringing me meals after surgery. The time where I could not wait to go scrub my pregnant friend's kitchen floor. My pastor laboring to bring about reconciliation. My daughter teaching third graders in the projects. A brother handing me a $50 bill when I could not feed my family years ago. And the images keep rolling like a movie in front of my eyes. She goes on. Every image of a human face or a hand or feet moving towards other faces, hands and feet. And it was all about the gift of oneself to another. It was about the reaching out and serving. Loving Jesus, she says, looks like loving people. Serving them no matter how costly. Staying up all night with a heartbroken teenager. Cooking up a storm for the homeless Thanksgiving. Making an abused woman feel like a diamond. Getting raw knees from praying for the brothers and sisters. Texting and investing into the discarded ones. Looking for ways to soothe the hearts and touching the lepers. And just being there. Loving Jesus. It's restoring human dignity where it's been lost. Loving Jesus, it's about being Jesus with skin on to the people who do life alongside us. Loving Jesus is living so close to Him and hanging out with Him so that we smell like Him. And then letting Him fill out our hands and hearts and feet with the compassion that He is. You want to respond to Jesus, sisters, brothers, then love him. Make him your first love. It won't take away from your spouse. It won't take away from your kids. It won't take away from your friends. Because there's an endless supply of love where it comes from. You make him first. I make him first. We make him first. Along with our other alarm that meets at 845, and all those the Lord is sending our way, and all those that we need and touch. If we do that, then this world will never be the same. And that's good. We pray with you. Holy God, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us and upon us, Lord, we don't only ask it when we begin worship, but we ask it as we begin to scatter and go our way to be in the mission field you've entrusted to each and every one of us. The field in our home, the field in our neighborhood, the field in our schools and in our workplace, the field that is in our heart. Lord, establish your reign in all of these places. Father, help us to love Jesus as you love us. Help us to be willing to go where he leads us, to have the courage of our conviction that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Lord, we are yours. Send us. Lavish us with your grace. Make your spirit to fall upon us. Thank you for forgiveness and for setting us free. 
pray this in the name of Jesus.